Hello and welcome to the second video in our video series called Breaking the Blockbuster Model, which will help you level up your teaching with technology. I'm Matt Miller, author and creator of Ditch That Textbook, and I'm joined by tech-loving teacher Nate Ridgway right here next to me, whose high school history classes have been transformed by technology. And uh, Nate, it has been super fun to see everybody's comments and all the response to this uh, first video, hasn't it? Yes, it's been awesome. Really, yeah. it, it's so fun to engage with a larger community. So, yeah, absolutely, and to see how everybody's kind of like mm -hmm. you know taking their own twist on it, like what they're what works for them and everything. It's been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, if you haven't met Nate yet, he teaches high school history in Central Indiana, and in his classes, technology has transformed how he teaches and how his students learned. He's actually flipped. No actually cloned his classroom, more on that in the next video. And he's provided his students rich digital resources and his students show what they know by creating with technology. And in this video series, Nate is sharing some of his best tips and strategies to make the most of the tech in your classroom. Now, in our last video, Nate talked about the movie theater model, a way to compare some of our traditional teaching strategies to the way that people watch movies and movie theaters. And the movie theater model isn't inherently bad, and there are ways that we can make the most of it. In our last video, Nate showed us how we can use lectures more strategically and purposefully, like recording direct instruction for later use. And if you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend that you go back and watch it because Nate shares some of his best tips as well as some of the things to be careful of with direct instruction. It's something that reaches so many grade levels and content areas in the whole K-12 universe. Now, in today's video, we're going to level up from the movie theater model and take a look at the blockbuster model. So, Nate, tell us a little bit about how blockbuster video is similar to the way that we teach and learn in classrooms. I know it's funny, right? Because, like, there is only now one blockbuster store left. Um, which ironically enough, you can go watch a documentary about it on Netflix. Um, but yeah, uh, Blockbuster is um, kind of our next step in our metaphorical journey of the classroom. Um, now, how is it exactly similar to the way that we learn and teach in classrooms? For me, it symbolizes the way that we always think and thought that classroom instruction and the parts of our classroom, it's just, it's the way it always has been. So that's why we do it. Um, and I think that a lot of folks assumed that Blockbuster was always going to be around. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we, we grew up in an age where if you, uh, you know, if you were to grab like a person's wallet or purse and open it up, you'd find like three cards inside. It'd be like a driver's license, a credit card and like a Blockbuster membership card. And you'd be like, <laughs> guaranteed to find the third one. Right. Um, but things changed. And um, you know, nowadays, again, you're probably not going to be able to walk down your street and get to a Blockbuster very easily or a family video or, you know, any other uh, variety of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so for me, like, it, it, it's, it's taking a very hard look at some of those practices that we've considered to be very traditional and kind of the status quo in our classrooms and taking a hard look at, like, is this what we want to keep doing going forward? Mm -hmm. So that, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so as far as that goes with the, uh, you know, kind of like with the movie theater model, even though Blockbuster has sort of, dis well, mostly disappeared, that doesn't mean that teaching with the Blockbuster model needs to disappear, right? Yeah, there's there's parts of it that are still very useful. Um, so like, you know, for example, like, you know, textbooks still around, um, but there's ways that we can use them that are better than you know, what we have. Uh, or, you know, another example is, you know, a blockbuster for the first time, like actually curated, you know, basically movies based off of people's interests. Like you could go in and pick something out. So there's there's bits and pieces there of of something that blockbuster was doing right. That was on to something, but it just didn't go far enough. It didn't make that next step. And so we're going to kind of, yeah, we get to look at some ways to um, make the most of what what it could have been. Yeah, yeah. So I want to put this uh, graphic up here on the screen that kind of walks us through the Blockbuster model. Do you want to kind of like take us through a couple of these things and, and help us to see the connection between the Blockbuster model, kind of like the way that it's always been and like how we can how we can progress forward? Yeah, absolutely. So like even when I was going through high school, like 
the idea of like, whenever I walked into a room, I knew I was always going to get a textbook. And the idea that like in a, in a classroom, like what I'm going to get is going to be centered on that text, right? And like students walking into a room know that for a lot of them that like, oh, I'm always going to get homework. The problem is, is that's not exactly how students learn uh, today. If you were to hand most students a textbook, um, probably where it's going to end up for a lot of them is in a locker or a backpack or lost. Um, and so maybe that needs to have some, you know, so, some second thoughts about how we use those things. Um, and I know that's a topic that's very near and dear to your heart, Matt. Right, um, yeah. And I think uh, then like something that like, and this is a really cool infographic actually, Matt, that we have from the book is like, what does the textbook of the future look like? Um, and this is where we can see that there's, there's a problem with textbooks, um, because they don't do any of these seven things that are on this infographic. Like when you get a textbook, it's like, it's perma, right? Like it's, it's, it's forever. It's, it's permanent. like you, it's unchangeable. And so like, if you can have like a, a resource that you can give students that it would be fluid as opposed to, you know, like in concrete, right. It's in stone. Um, you know, something that can be searchable for students, that's inquiry based. So instead of setting up a textbook as more like of an encyclopedia, we have it more as like, oh, well, this is a problem that I need help solving. We think about it from more of a, like almost like a PBL lens, right? Like a student centric lens. Like what is, what is the need that this student has that they need to solve? Um, the customizable thing with textbooks is really fascinating. And the idea that like you could have texts that are infinitely tweakable to what a particular student needs at a certain time is something that, again, most physical textbooks simply aren't capable of doing. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of like a textbook being interactive uh, and also cooperative, again, these are things that just like most textbooks can't do in their current state and form. And so, you know, uh, there, there's some serious modification here that, that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yep, yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you. Um, yeah. Was there anything else in the blockbuster model you wanted to walk us through? Yes, I, I'd also I I want to I want to go on my personal crusade here of um, getting uh, talking about homework, um, homework in and this is an infographic that I was more than delighted to design for for the book. Uh, zombie hunches about homework because these hunches simply will not die. Uh, they just <laughs> won't go away. Uh, and I, I even heard this in a meeting today that I had, um, well, we need to give kids homework because it teaches accountability. Um, there, unfortunately, there's no research that supports that homework teaches responsibility or instills obedience. Um, if you find one, please send it along. I would love to look at it. Um, but it, again, it, it's just a hunch that we have like, oh, if kids, you know, if it like, if they're not doing the homework, um, you know, that like, they're not going to be held accountable to things. It's, it's it, you're kind of setting up a, a false assumption there. And that actually gets us to the second point, which is that students who do homework are inherently good. Uh, and students who do, who do not do homework are inherently bad. And if you think about that second assumption, that if a student doesn't do the work, that means automatically they're a bad person. That's a really, really dangerous assumption to have, right? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't look at the context of essentially the the support that, that student has, for example, or you know the you know how students have access to you know getting that homework done. Um, also, and this is what makes homework a particularly difficult thing, uh, is that everybody has kind of bought into what uh, Vatertrot here, who is the um, one of the researchers that I pulled this from, she, she calls it the cult of homework. Um, and, and it's just like, well, teachers feel like they have to give it, right? Uh, because they don't want to be seen as the, the soft teacher. And admin feels like students should be doing it because that's one, they, they feel like that's the easiest way that work can be measured. Parents also want students to be doing homework because they're like, well, if my kids aren't doing homework, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, that's that's also you know not, not exactly true. Um, and so I, I generally encourage instead of lots of homework, thinking about the quality of what we're having students do rather than the quantity of it. And there's lots of fun examples that we give in the book about how I can take something very easy, like a vocab 
you know, like a list of vocab. And instead of having students do the drill and kill of writing the vocab word and, you know, then uh, you know, maybe drawing a picture or something like that, uh, instead of like turning it into a puzzle or something that's playable or, you know, turning, turning it into a memory game. And there's, there's things that we can do that make it a much more meaningful learning experience as opposed mm -hmm. to something that is just assigned. Yeah. Um, the last thing about homework is something called the homework trap. And this is a particularly thorny issue because how homework is rewarded in our class, especially around grading, creates something that is yeah, indeed called the, the homework trap. And what this is, is that, well, students, they, you know, I, for whatever reason, you know, it could, could be they, you know, were avoiding the assignment or, you know, they, they weren't there that day. Who knows uh, that because then late work happens, they know they have points coming off, their grades go down. So therefore their attitude and their motivation goes down. And then that builds even more avoidance of homework and resentment. And that results in even more late work. And it just becomes this incredibly destructive cycle that can happen with students where they feel like there's, there's no chance of redemption. And what I would encourage people to think about with this is that late work is like the blockbuster membership that you never wanted to ever have. And oh. we all know the feeling if, if you lived in the Blockbuster era of knowing you had a late fee on your Blockbuster membership card and you're like, oh, I got to return that film. But oh, but if I go back, then I'm going to have to pay the fee. And so what do you do? You don't go back to the store, mm -hmm. right? It's the number one thing from keeping you from going back. And, and this is ultimately why in terms of like thinking about homework, and this gets me to the next point about thinking about stuff like flexibility and grace um, this is where relationships become really, really key. Um, Blockbuster was not interested in having a relationship with their customers. And the one thing they hated about Blockbuster was the late fees. And the thing is, actually, if you really think about it, Blockbuster didn't want us to change our behavior with late fees because that was how they generated cash and money. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but think about it like a different thing. Imagine you go to a local mom and pop video store and they say, hey, you know, like, you know, it's your neighbor, you know them, right? Like, hey, I noticed you had this, you know, book out, um, you know, or this, this movie out, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I know you, you know me, I, I know you're good for it. Uh, next time you're here, can you make sure you bring it back? And because you have that relationship with that person, as opposed to some random teenager behind a blockbuster counter, because of that relationship and, and that, that expectation and that accountability of that relationship, your behavior does indeed change. So there's, there's stuff here about relationships and grading that is all kind of inside of this blockbuster model that, that's really, really important. Yeah, yeah. And see, I love just this whole idea, kind of like what you said, we've got the blockbuster model that kind of uh, represents all of the things that we've always done before, all of those traditional practices that maybe we need to revisit, which plays so nicely together with the movie theater model, which is kind of focused on the direct instruction, which we do so much. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, we've got these two, you know, sort of um, pillars of traditional teaching that we're kind yeah. of revisiting and not saying that we have to throw all of them out, mm -hmm. but, you know, research and best practice and stuff all, all says that there, there are some different ways that we can do it. So um, yeah, yeah this, this has been fantastic. And the nice thing too, is that, you know, we don't have to do all of it right away. We can kind of take it one step at a time and evolve mm -hmm. our practice forward and yes. all good stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Nate. Mm -hmm. And so um, we got two videos down now and two to go in our four part video series called Breaking the Blockbuster Model. And we've talked about some strategies around the movie theater model, like recording our instruction or making the most of the blockbuster model by rethinking some of our traditional approaches. So the next video is the culmination of this whole series, the moment where we get to break the blockbuster model. And in this next video, Nate's going to talk about the next step where we move from the blockbuster model to a model so many of us are familiar with now, the Netflix model or the streaming model. Uh -huh. And, you know, Netflix has become a way of life for so many of us. So what lessons can we learn from its success? How can we use it to transform our classrooms in ways that are manageable, but also have impact? That's what we'll tackle in this next video. Nate, this one, this is going to be a good one, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, but for right now, we want to hear from you. So before you leave, would you add a comment down below and answer one of these questions? Here's question one. What are some traditional teaching practices that you've had to rethink over the years? 
And question two, how has technology helped you to do more, to do better, to make class more engaging? Either of those questions, we'd love it if you'd leave a comment just down below and answer it just to let us know. And we'll be kind of keeping an eye on those comments and jumping in ourselves. Also, if you know someone who would love this video series, can you send them to this link? Just have them go to ditch.link slash blockbuster. That's ditch.link slash blockbuster to find this video series. Or they can sign up for email updates by going to ditchthattextbook.com slash 101 to join our email list. All right, this has been great. Thanks so much for watching this video and we will see you in the comments and in our next video. Take care.